Lamborghini is ready to unleash its Urus Super SUV. I am in Rome to drive the world's fastest SUV. It has a top speed of 305 km per hour, 0 to 100 km per hour in 3.6 seconds and 0 to 200 in 12.8 seconds and 100 to 0 km per hour stopping distance of just 33.7 meters. All these figures qualify as best in class, says Lamborghini, because its owner Audi and the VW Group have thrown everything at the development of this car. The Urus defies physics and does what you simply don't expect or believe a vehicle of this shape, size and weight can do. The Urus uses the VW Group's MLB platform, meaning it does have underpinnings in common with the Q7 and the Cayenne. But that's it. It is by far an immensely advanced vehicle otherwise. It is also the first vehicle in Lamborghini's history not to use a naturally aspirated engine. And so what you have under the hood is a 4-litre bi-turbo twin-scroll petrol V8 that belts out a massive 641 horses and more importantly, a generous dose of peak torque at 850 Nm at 2250 to 4500 RPM. And that right there tells you why Lamborghini needed to go turbo. The day has finally arrived. I am so eager to get behind the wheel of the Urus. I have been waiting for this ever since December when I saw the car for the first time at the world premiere. This is one car I've been dying to drive. Now, the good news is that I get to spend ample time with it because we get to try all three aspects of this story. We're out on the open road with the car right now. And right after that, we get onto the track, which is where the whole point of it being a Lamborghini comes to life. And then it's an SUV. A super SUV but an SUV nonetheless and which means we also get to check out its capability off-road. It was actually great that I got to experience the car on the road first. As you've seen I've selected a dark blue one to begin my drive, kitted out with a top spec 23 inch Pirelli's and equipped with a sunroof. The road route comprised very narrow and rather bumpy broken tarmac around the pretty Bracciano Lake and immediately the car impresses. It is quick, make that very quick and you have to watch yourself as the ease with which it pulls to three digit speeds is admirable. It's also very agile and nimble and this is what I expected coming into this drive and I have to say I'm not disappointed at all. The car has different driving modes of course, the Strada for street or regular road use, Sport for when you want to stiffen things up a bit and get a sharper response, Corsa for the track with long revs. Sport and Corsa drop the car's air suspension by 15 millimeters for sportier handling by the way. Then there are three modes that raise the regular ride height by 40 millimeters. There's Terra, Italian for gravel, for off-road driving, Sabia or sand mode and finally Neve for snow. All of this is housed under a lever called Anima which is part of the Tamburo which sits at the base of the central console. The Tamburo comprises the Anima toggle on the left side, an Ego toggle on the other, the chunky industrial looking gear shift and the start stop button which like all Lambos has the red cover that you flip open. The Ego lever on the right is named so because it allows you to set the suspension, throttle and steering the way that you like and the car will remember your settings so you don't have to select it again the next time. So having driven in Strada and Sport. I had tasted blood and now I wanted to jump all in. So I made my way back to the Vallelunga circuit which is where the cars were based for the day and got ready for the track. The only other time Lamborghini ever made an SUV was in 1986, the very military LM002. Just 300 of those were made and it's quite the collector's item now. 
So done with the road experience, now it's onto the track and I'll tell you what, I'm getting excited, can't wait. And as you can see, I've switched colors as well now because uh, we're going for the nice bright yellow on the track. It's the car that you've been used to seeing as well, so I'm excited, still am. Now, when it was evident that Lamborghini was going to do an SUV, I think in many ways it had to be an homage to the LM002. You see that straight away in the uh, wheel arches, a bit of that power dome that you get here on the hood. But otherwise, in every other aspect of the car, you straight away pick up what you know of Lamborghini. And it is that terrific lineage of super sports cars. So, Giallo Auge or Vogue Yellow. And the car has P0 tires, no sunroof, so better suited to the track. So leaving the pit lane now at the uh, Vallelunga circuit, which used to be home to the Rome Grand Prix at one point of time. It's about four kilometers and a little bit as far as the track length is concerned. Here we go. So we're starting off with a warm-up lap and straight away I've got the car into uh, sport, the uh, Anima, switch to sport. Oh, that sounds nice. I began with a warm up in sport and soon switched to Corsa, then stayed there. The Lamborghini team had promised everybody four laps but were generous and allowed me to enjoy just a few more, quite a few more. So unlike the character that you got driving on the road here, it's very apparent that uh, that whole super sports car feel comes to the fore and uh, more so from the uh, gearbox, the way the car is changing its gears, the way it's downshifting. Oh, it's so sports car like in terms of response. With each lap, you start to think you're getting better because you're going around the track faster and hitting the corners more accurately. But that's when you realize how good the car is. It's not you, it's the car. The Urus will make you feel like a champion racer because it makes everything so effortless. Unlike its big sister, the Aventador, which doesn't forgive any mistakes. The way the engineers have been able to hide the car's weight alter the laws of physics and just allow you pure exhilaration from an SUV on the track is nothing short of unbelievable. Oh man, that is blisteringly fast. Whew, it gets up to speeds close to 200 without any flinch whatsoever. And before you can say 200. The car feels like it was born for the track and hits every turn and will fly through corners faster than you expect it to. And it stays flat, completely belying its height and bulk. Full marks to the company's longtime tire partner Pirelli as well here. And Lamborghini engineers, take a bow, please. Ah, oh, that's such a delicious amount of torque coming through right away. It's so immediate. That is uh, just so satisfying. And you know, I have to tell you, the car also has four wheel steering and one of the biggest reasons to do that of course is to compensate for the long wheelbase. I mean effectively Lamborghini says having four wheel steering cuts down you know overall wheelbase length by as much as 600 millimeters notionally speaking. That is huge. It makes it then a shorter wheelbase. All right that was the instruction from the instructor but shorter wheelbase than the Huracan. Think about that. The car suffers no turbo lag by the way and I quite like the rumble that it emits from its pipes. It's not quite the electric shriek of the Lamborghini V10s or V12s, of course, but I still like the angry note that it puts out. There's no switch though to make the engine louder and so if you want to hear it roar and rumble, crackle and pop, well you have to keep it in sport or Corsa. Now, I've driven my fair share of these performance SUVs and you know when you're driving one of them on the track you're always sort of making that little compensation if you will for the fact that it's an SUV you know the mass of the car the fact that you sort of lean into corners and uh, well, you know that the nose would dip none of that is happening on this car so you know your brains going what that to me is uh, the real statement that's what makes it a Lamborghini 
and I'm relieved. I'm relieved that it has that character, but I have to say, I'm also surprised. The Urus uses active roll stability control that stiffens the outer suspension when entering a corner. The torque vectoring system comprising a center torsion diff and an active rear diff cuts any understeer. The two systems allow the chassis to stay parallel to the ground and also lets you come out of that corner much quicker. The smile on my face has now broadened to a wide grin. But that is how satisfying this car is. Am I comparing it to the Super Sport siblings? Not at all. But I dare not compare it to any SUVs either. No, senor. As much as the car will scorch the track, it will also easily do the school drops, supermarket runs, and any other everyday activity with ease. The Urus is available in a four or five seater Avtar, and the four seater is the more plush, the five, the more practical. The roof line suggests less headroom at the back, but you'll be surprised by how roomy the cabin actually is. In fact, the company says the rear seats can comfortably seat someone 6 feet 3 inches tall. I have to say I was surprised by how much space even I had, head, leg and elbow room. Luggage space is also a surprise at 616 litres. Drop the rear seats and you get 1596 litres. At the front, you get three digital screens, one for the virtual instrument cluster and two touch screens in the central console. They'll allow you to customize the displays and access everything you need. And yes, the twin screen infotainment is obviously borrowed from the new Audi A8 and takes the Urus into cutting edge, uber cool territory straight away in keeping with the coming trend of touch versus dials and buttons. The graphics are very cool and you get all the guidance and connectivity options your greedy little heart desires and a great Bang & Olufsen sound system. The interior can be customized as you'd like and there's ample leather and Alcantara to please the connoisseur. You can get massage seats, rear video screens, the sunroof and many more options. Finally, time for the last activity, heading off-road. You've forgotten it's an SUV? So on to the Verde Ebe or dark green car now. I was asked to drive in Terra mode. The gravelly and very dusty track was set up to demonstrate how fast the car can go on loose and bumpy surfaces. So it wasn't so much of a rock crawl a la Jeep or Land Rover, but more like a rally stage. So while the car is designed to be the speed demon that it is, it can go off the road and get you across fast on the mud too. It's not quite the off-roader of the year, but will do cross country with relative ease. Once Lamborghini had decided 7 or 8 years ago that going to an SUV model was clear, it started to chart out a course. That meant taking the best of what exists and adding what was needed. And so the final product had the following from the Aventador side. Four-wheel drive, four-wheel steering, active damping, and the Ego mode. From the Huracan, it takes the Anima P0 Corsa tire option, carbon ceramic brakes, and Lamborghini's Piattaforma Inerziale, a system that governs all car systems at the same time, and helps detect all chassis movements to keep the correct mode engaged effectively. The new bits that have been added because it's an SUV, the active torque vectoring, adaptive air suspension and active anti-roll bar, all very SUV characteristics necessary to build the car well and afford it the right sportive driving character it needed. The car has already been launched in India at 3 crore rupees and it is sold out everywhere. Lamborghini is already at its highest ever revenue and even its highest ever production. Last year it sold just over 3800 cars, which is a big number for this small company. But that number will double with the Urus and so that's the kind of importance this model has 
for this company. And think about this, it always knew that it was going after new kinds of buyers for the first time, but of all the massive bookings it's already got around the world, 68% are first time Lamborghini customers. That's a number that's taken even the company by surprise. And you better believe it, the first two years of production already sold out. Now, I did promise you that I'd get you an exclusive first ride review of the Gen Z scooter in a place that was much warmer than Detroit. Detroit, of course, is where we showed you all the show, all the tech that goes into one of these high-tech electric scooters. Uh, we are, of course, in sunny San Francisco. We've got blue skies above us, the Golden Gate on our right, Alcatraz on our left, the beautiful bay behind us, and we're going to enjoy going around San Francisco on one of these clean green vehicles. Now, it does have, of course, a mile of just, uh, a range of just 30 miles, and it does sometimes struggle to get up those very, very steep San Francisco hills, but uh, I bet it's gonna be a lot of fun riding this around, because even at slow speeds, sometimes you do can have a lot of fun. The Mahindra Gen Z is perfect for a city like San Francisco where electric and hybrid vehicles are the norm. Under the skin, the Gen Z is powered by a lithium ion 2 kilowatt hour battery and a 48 volt electric system. The motor makes just 2 horsepower, but the big figure, just like I told you last week too, is 100 Newton meters of torque. Comparatively, the Alto makes just 69 Newton meters of peak torque. The range on this particular Gen Z electric scooter is about 48 kilometers as it is about a year old but the new ones now get a slightly better range of 56 kilometers. Top speed is just under 52 and 0 to 50 kilometers per hour is achieved in ideally about 10 seconds. For someone on the heavier side though, like me, that time is, well, a little slower. But it does feel nimble, really, really nimble, especially in traffic or from a standstill. But this is San Francisco and one does have to deal with very, very hilly roads. So let's see how that worked out. Well, this is definitely one of the steeper roads in San Francisco that I've ridden up on and uh, we can't be doing about 15 miles an hour. It seems to handle this pretty well. Uh, the Mustang in the Princess Diaries did actually struggle to climb this. This doesn't. So that's quite surprising considering the fact that it is tiny. It does have a very limited uh, battery power and a limited battery range. But it does seem to be coping even with these steep streets surprisingly well. Then the roads got a little steeper and the Gen Z did start to struggle a little bit. Okay, so the first really steep street, it did make it up quite impressively. The second one, not so much. It is, after all, a tiny electric motor. It did require some little leg power there, but uh, eventually it did. It stopped for a bit, had some juice again, and went up. We are now, of course, going to do the world-famous Lombard Street. Luckily, that is going down and not coming up. So, um, just going to hang on, get on the brakes, and get with it. Now while you can spec a Gen Z with a cheaper LCD screen for basic information, this particular one has the top of the line touch screen. This Gen Z does not require a key to get it going, just press the start button, the screen comes on, enter your 4 digit code and you're good to go. The screen also displays a ton and more of information including your battery charge levels, range and some general diagnostics about the scooter and the battery. And then of course, you can also go between your riding modes. 
you can have it in easy for a gentle ride around the city or on the mode I prefer, sport for a little more juice in the boots. The difference is immediate and the sport mode does make it a lot better in terms of the way it rides. Riding position does take a little getting used to as the handlebars are a little higher than your average Indian scooter and it does ride stiff. The roads in San Francisco are some of the bumpiest around the United States and the stiff ride would have meant a sore butt if not for the massive and rather comfortable saddle. All in all though, the Mahindra Gen Z is meant to be a workhorse first and with the loading bay at the back, it does its job really well. In San Francisco, you can hire them around with a third party app and use them to ride around the city and take in the sights and sounds exactly like the way we did. And to be honest, for a city as pretty and vibrant as this, being open and exposed to the elements and doing it at a slow pace is absolutely perfect. And since you are using a zero emissions vehicle, the seagulls seem to be happy too.